Okay, good afternoon. My name is Greg Engel, and I have the privilege of being the moderator of the next panel. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to note that the last time I was on this stage, I was hosting a conversation with the, uh, the director of the Peace Corps. And it was much different, uh, other than the two of us, ever, no one else had a suit on. I think they mostly had flip-flops. But, uh, and they ate all the food that was in sight. Um, no, we're very privileged uh, uh, this afternoon to have three very experienced and well-regarded uh, foreign affairs experts with us to give us their diplomatic perspective on the topic of the day, alliances, uh, and partnerships in American security. On my immediate right, we have Elliot Abrams, the former Deputy National Security Advisor to George Bush from 2005 to 2009, and currently Senior Director for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Beside Elliot, we have Paula Dobryansky, the former Under Secretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs and currently a senior fellow at the Belfort uh, School of uh, Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School at Harvard. And beside Paula, we have David Kramer, who's the former Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and is now the Director of Human Rights and Human Freedoms at the McCain Institute. Now, I've been told to keep the introductions very short, so given that, if you haven't done so already, uh, please take the opportunity to read our panelists' bios in your conference material to fully appreciate the depth uh, of their experience. At this point, I'm going to turn the show over to our, to our panelists and ask each of them to make remarks, and we'll have plenty of time for questions thereafter, but I warn you in advance, I'm reserving the right of the last question to myself. So welcome to Austin, welcome to UT, and we look forward to hearing your comments. Thanks very much. Uh, I thought I'd start just by, I think, on behalf of all the panelists, expressing resentment that we didn't get t-shirts. So <laughs> <laughs> next year, next year, everybody gets a t-shirt. Um, I want to talk um, a bit about the Middle East, where um, we do have very strong um, old alliances in some cases. There is a famous photo that, that you find easily on the internet that's plastered all over uh, the Saudi embassy in Washington of Franklin D. Roosevelt and the founder of modern uh, Saudi Arabia, Ibn Saud, meeting at the Great Bitter Lake, and I guess it was 45. Um, that's one of the oldest alliances, but we have many um, others in the region. And those alliances have, in a sense, been strengthened recently because we have some common enemies of real concern. Uh, Iran, which is the enemy of every traditional ally we've got in the region, and the, call it what you will, the jihadis, um, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, which is a threat to, um, to all of our um, allies. Um, the relationships were not in great shape, I'd say, uh, frankly, at the beginning of this year because there was a perception on their part that the U.S. government was determined above all else to get the uh, JCPOA, the nuclear agreement with Iran, and therefore was uh, dealing with Iran uh, behind their backs, over their heads, and not paying sufficient attention to the security challenges that Iran presented to all of them. Um, particularly the Gulf countries, to Jordan, to Israel, to Egypt. Um, so the alliances were, I would say, um, a bit fraying. Uh, the turnaround began early, uh, and it was symbolized in the president's trip, I guess his first foreign trip, to Israel and Saudi Arabia. And in Saudi Arabia, he met with the leaders of a bunch of uh, Sunni countries, um, uh, Arab, non-Arab, Muslim countries. Um, there's also less tension now with Israel over many of the uh, Palestinian issues. So I would say we went through a period of tension, and the, the tension is um, diminishing, and the issue is, is in, really truly um, what to do about Iran. 
above all, what to do about Iran, uh, a country that all of our allies uh, have a very uh, dim uh, view of. So why isn't everything um, hunky-dory if we have, we share these opponents, we share uh, largely views of the region? A um, couple of reasons that are worth mentioning because I think we see them in a lot of alliances the United States has. First of all, there are rivalries among our allies. Um, until recently, we would have said that the Gulf Cooperation Council, Sunni, Arab, countries on the uh, western side of the, of the Arabian or Persian Gulf, um, were all in it together. These were our allies. They had terrific close relationships. But now, of course, there's a terrible spat that several of them are having with Qatar. Uh, and it's, it's a sort of classic case of your allies um, fighting with each other and making it much more difficult for us um, to have good relationships with all of them. Um, the Kurdish question. We have a relationship with Iraq. We've had a good long relationship with the Kurds, but obviously the independence question affects uh, Iraq and it affects Turkey. So good examples, I think, of, of one of the great complications of alliances which is that you cannot assume that your allies actually get along with each other. Um, secondly, it's never the case that with our allies we have identical interests. We don't have identical interests with Canada. We don't have identical interests with the UK. And we certainly don't have identical interests with our Middle Eastern allies. Um, we have a big overlap, but uh, for example, we certainly don't have the same view of the Kurds that the Turks and Iraqis do. That, that's a, a perfect example. Um, we have a close relationship with Israel. We have a close relationship with Jordan. They have a pretty close relationship. But these are not identical assessments, uh, ours and those of those countries. Same thing, of course, with, um, with Egypt. Um, and I'd like to introduce one word that I think is really important in assessing alliance relationships, and the word is salience. There are issues on which we may not even disagree, but we just don't care much. If you're an Egyptian, one of the top issues in the world for you today is the question of the Nile waters. And there's a huge dispute between Egypt and Ethiopia. Well, I don't see anybody here throwing stones at me for even mentioning this. This is not a big deal in Washington. It's just not a salient issue for most Americans. And even if you've heard of it, even if you know something about it, you probably, frankly, you probably don't care much about it. Um, it's a big deal to Egypt. And I think one can really extrapolate from this very often. Well, for example, in the Obama administration, uh, there was the question of uh, Israeli settlement expansion. Much less so. The Trump administration has decided that's not really a salient issue for the United States. So I think that's a, a significant um, issue um, for all of our alliances. And I'll add one more. Human rights, something that all three of us have had spent a lot of time on over, over the years. Um, we have alliances that are weakened or interfered with or challenged, let's say, by the human rights violations of the country that is an ally of the United States. Um, and Egypt is a very good e example of this, where there are now 60,000 political prisoners. Do we care about that? What is the impact of that on the alliance with the United States? It does have an impact, and witness the fact that uh, what, about a month ago, the administration announced $95 million in military aid to Egypt being given to other countries and $195 million in economic and military aid is being suspended, largely for human rights reasons. So um, our alliances are about foreign affairs and national security matters. But we are not, because we're Americans, we are not indifferent to the internal situation within allied countries. And we're not indifferent to it partly for moral reasons. And we're not indifferent to it partly because 
if things get bad enough, you're going to lose the government in question. I mean, thus, for example, Hosni Mubarak and a number of other leaders um, in the Middle East, I mean, the Arab Spring overthrew an, uh, a couple of people who were opponents of the US, but a couple of people who were viewed, Mubarak and Ben Ali in Tunisia, as essentially allies of the United States. There's a famous phrase of Franklin Roosevelt um, about the first Somoza, Anastasio Somoza in Nicaragua, uh, when questioned about you know, what a horrible dictator he was. Uh, Roosevelt said, well, he is a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, meaning he was on our side in what was then um, the great struggle. And we do struggle all the time. We did during the Cold War when the issue was communism. We do now when the issue is really terrorism and Islamist extremism. Um, we struggle with what to do with the people who, uh, to borrow Franklin Roosevelt's phrase, are our sons of bitches. Um, so let me just spend a minute before um, passing the uh, baton here, um, some suggestions about how we deal with some of these alliance questions. Um, first, we need to do a better job at explaining our policies to our allies. I think too often we adopt policies without actually talking to them, and this is a theme you've heard uh, really all day, without listening uh, to them. And talking to them is important, and listening to them is even more important. Again, because some of these things on which we're taking positions are significant to us, but they're much more salient to them. Um, so for example, when we, well, let's say Iran policy, hugely important. It's very important to us, but more important if you are a neighbor of Iran, or if you are, let's say, Israel, and you're listening to death to Israel all the time. So that's one uh, thing we need to do. Um, we also need, I think, to do a better job of letting our allies know we're with them. That is, of, of saying, in many cases, it's just a matter of having the president or the secretary of state, secretary of defense, declare, again, you have a new administration, you need to declare again. Uh, we view you as a valuable ally. That's why these visits of sec state, sec def, president, are really important. Yes, the new team also views you as a valuable ally. You're not part of our past. You're part of our present. And we are willing to make um, commitments. Uh, third thing I'd say is it's nice when we can get our allies to be friends. It saves us a lot of trouble. So for example, um, we should be encouraging the now nascent and still secret Israeli-Arab security relationships. That's a good thing for them. It's a good thing for us. Because for a long time, uh, there was an argument that our closeness with Israel uh, cost us a lot in the Arab world. Um, it doesn't seem to cost us anything with Arab governments at this point. But the more they move closer to each other, this is mostly thanks to Iran, their common enemy, but the more they talk to each other, cooperate with each other, even uh, secretly, the easier it is um, for us. Um, so we need to do more of that and a place where we could do uh, that. Again, the uh, Israeli-Palestinian dispute, as always, if we can lower the temperature some, it just makes life um, easy for us. Final point. When we talk about alliances, we are certainly not talking about a substitute for American leadership. We are talking about ways of enhancing the impact of American leadership. I think that even with the most obstreperous allies, we find very few cases where their, their real message is go away, leave us alone. Usually the message is, uh, where are you? We need better leadership. We need more American involvement. So the critical thing about alliances, I think, is if, and the Middle East is a very good example of this, is to think of alliances as a way of enhancing American power and influence in the world. These alliances are not alliances that we have built up, that we have entered into and strengthened because we're nice people. They exist because we have seen them as ways of getting what we want to have happen in the world 
at a lower price. They're ways of magnifying American power and influence, which is why I would argue um, if we're going to strengthen the American role in the world, um, this is a sensible and frankly bargain basement price way of doing it, uh, strengthen American alliances. Thank you very much. I think we could have a whole session just on uh, the things you said, and I think I could ask questions and they'd keep coming. So. Great. Well, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here, and I want to commend the organizers for holding this. Uh, it really is very timely to step back and to look at uh, our alliances globally. I want to devote my comments particularly to the importance of alliances in the context of our transatlantic relations. And of course, uh, I, it's so essential to focus on one of the most successful alliances in history, which is that of NATO. Uh, NATO has been going through a number of evolutions, and it also has been challenged. I would submit that NATO, for our own national security interests and that of our friends and our allies, is absolutely not only indispensable, but essential. Uh, what is very unique about it is it's not just a military alliance. This is where this concept of dime, you know, with diplomacy, intel, military, and economy does fit together. But especially because we're talking about diplomacy, I think I could say very confidently the political aspect is absolutely crucial here. Because if you don't have that strength and that institutional backing of the military alliance, the show of force by NATO, your diplomacy could suffer for it. And I think uh, that is something that we could see uh, uh, playing out in, uh, in the case of, of Europe. The other important aspect of this alliance is the fact that when you look back historically, it has preserved peace, security, and stability uh, since the Second World War and also post-Cold War. And very uniquely, it's founded on common values. Let's not forget that. There's a strong basis of common values, common interests, common goals, which bring us together. And that's not to say, as Elliot mentioned, we don't have our differences. But there is a common foundation that even with the differences, we're part of a family because this is collective defense. It's a collective unit, and there's a unity of purpose. I would say that when you weigh the pros and the cons of being part of an alliance, even despite some of the tensions and some of the differences that exist, I would submit that the benefits certainly outweigh the differences. The enhanced, of course, the enhanced military capacity is crucial. The fact that with NATO, the collective defense, Article, uh, Article 5, uh, an attack on one is an attack on all. If you remember 9-11 and actually the rallying around us in that context, by the way, it also provides a strong deterrent value against aggression. Um, that doesn't always thwart aggression, as, as we've seen uh, played out. But it certainly is a vehicle for then setting up the framework thereafter. For example, in the case of NATO and the recent developments of the forward deployment of troops on the front lines um, uh, of uh, Central Eastern Europe, front lines bordering uh, Russia. I would also submit here that the political dimension is crucial. I used the term before, but I want to underscore it again, the unity of purpose. Why does that matter? Let me mention some of the core challenges that are confronting us. The first one that I would pick out, which I think is truly the most uh, uh, concerning, is that of what's posed by Russia. Going back to the Munich Security Conference of 2007, Putin, on that occasion, used that platform to lay out the, the goals, the vision of what was to come even in fuller detail of how there was a disassociation from Western values, 
how there was a criticism of the kind of architecture that existed post World War II, post Cold War, that that was not acceptable anymore. And of course, uh, he was manifesting his, his uh, agitation with the loss of what constituted the sphere of influence for Moscow. But it wasn't only that. I would also add in this, it was also clearly the statements about the ability to go in under any circumstances to protect the rights of, of, of Russians, wherever they're living. Uh, Russian-speaking uh, natives in whatever country in Europe basically was bucking up against the kind of framework, the as we know it, the liberal rules-based order. And that's what undergirds NATO. That's what undergirds our alliance in this case. It is one of, I would say, the most serious challenges that we are up against uh, in, this, uh, in this case. And one which we cannot uh, be complacent uh, about, either us or our um, uh, allies. I would also say there's a second challenge before us, and Eliot referred to it. He concluded, in a way, on the point of leadership and the importance of engagement. And here we've had, when you look back uh, in the past, the past uh, uh, number of years, um, there are examples where we opted in the context of the alliance to move ourselves aside and not to actually take that leadership role. I mention this to you because it's significant. Actually, in this particular case, I would say that you can look at time and again where we are looked to for our leadership. Part of leadership is working with others, it's listening, it's engaging, it's co-opting, it's setting an agenda. And here, of course, it's protecting all of our uh, national security interests, and it's also providing a deterrent value against aggression. So here, that's a second component that I think is absolutely crucial in going forward. It's not only dealing with the threats before us, the threat of aggression in eastern Ukraine, the illegal annexation of Crimea, the issue of, of terrorism and uh, the impact of terrorism playing out in the context of not just only the transatlantic relationship but more, more globally. All of these pose a threat, but there's the political dimension. There is that diplomatic dimension of what is our role and what should it be. In this case, let me inject, there's um, a document, some of you may be familiar with the name, of the Budapest Memorandum. I wanted to single it out because the Budapest Memorandum was significant as particularly relevant to Ukraine. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in return for the uh, territorial, its protection of its territory and uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty. And in this case, uh, it was violated with the aggression into eastern Ukraine and no less uh, the uh, illegal annexation of Crimea. And why I, I want to pick this out is because that also has relevance to us and our credibility and how we are perceived, perceived as a member of an alliance and what our responsibilities are. It's interesting, at the end of my remarks, I am going to say a few words uh, about Asia, but let me make a link now. You know, this very issue is linked to what's going on in Asia. And you know why? Because at the very time that this was playing out in Ukraine, it's interesting, many Asian articles, like the Japanese press, Korean press, South Korean press, basically were focused on the question of extended nuclear deterrence. And what does that mean for these countries and the reliability of our alliance commitments. So, you know, the actions in one place have consequences certainly for alliances in other places. And although there isn't a kind of an alliance structure in Asia that is the same as that of, of NATO in the context of a multilateral alliance, the relationships that we have, the bilateral relationships and military commitments that we have, of course with Japan, Australia, South Korea, many of our allies and partners, uh, to mention just those few, um, it matters, it matters. 
A few other points uh, in terms of challenges. I would say that in looking back over where we've been and where we are, I used the term before of complacency. We can't afford to be complacent. And here the alliance uh, uh, brings uh, together the nexus of military with political. There's a moral narrative that has, needs to be had here and needs to be advanced. And that is that we do care about those values, those institutions, those, that alliance structure that has preserved peace and stability, security. It has worked. It does, that doesn't mean it doesn't need to evolve and it doesn't need to uh, make itself maybe more agile. But certainly in this case, complacency, we cannot afford to be complacent. Because if you, one looks at the actions, particularly emanating from the East, in particular Moscow, as I said, to me, that's one of the greatest challenges confronting our alliance structure at this, at this time. Let me also um, add another two other elements into this. Uh, equation. And that is that obviously when you have an alliance structure, it's not operating in isolation of other events on the ground. And two that I want to mention is of course the debate over burden sharing. By the way, as I think uh, most know in this room, I mean from Republican to Democratic to Republican to Democratic administration, burden sharing has been very much part of the discourse that we've had within the NATO alliance. And I would say that uh, 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 this is key in terms of what other countries do and how they step forward. I was very struck by General Mattis, uh, our Secretary of Defense, when he delivered his remarks at this uh, past year's Munich Security Conference, and he emphasized the importance of the next generation and that each and every one of us have to care about our own investment in the alliance because it is the welfare of our own people and our next generations, that it can't be the sole responsibility of one country. I think that that has been changing and shifting and going forward, and I think that's a positive, very positive development. I also will add the element of sanctions. Because just as the alliance is playing out and the forward deployments and the agenda setting, there is also the issue of how one deals uh, in impacting particularly Moscow's actions through sanctions. Recently, Congress passed additional sanctions. And there was an outcry from a number of our allies. And the reason why was because it affects their energy equation. I'm mentioning this in particular to show that it isn't always smooth sailing, as was described, uh, that there are tensions. But to me, that's the strength, in a way, of the alliance. The fact that there are commonalities, but there are differences. It's those differences that get fleshed out and actually, in turn, I think, actually make it even the more stronger, um, or more strong. A few last words on Asia. I connected a few dots relative to the question of, of uh, extended nuclear deterrence. This matters greatly to Japan. For us, forward deployed troops, forward, forward stationed um, uh, assets in Asia matter to us. We don't have the kind of comparable alliance structure as is NATO, as I said. Actually, our former head of Pacific Command, Dennis Blair, use the term of describing the alliance in Asia as one of being a hub and the spokes. We're the hub, and then there are all the spokes out to the various countries, our partners and friends, in the context of various treaties, protocols, uh, the relationships that we have with other countries and our commitments. I think what is unique about it is, is that uh, actually through that spoke and the, uh, or the hub and the spokes, we have counted on our friends for their advice, for their uh, commitment, and have really sifted through some very complex problems. Obviously, one playing out is the issue of North Korea now, where a number of these allies in uh, Asia uh, really do, uh, do matter greatly. I'll end on this note. 
And speaking of alliances, I can't help say a few words about Australia. Everyone always focuses, of course, on, on our Asian uh, colleagues and partners, but Australia is truly, in my view, a bedrock of our partnerships. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but for the State Department, there are only a few countries where we permit other diplomats to come in and to serve, UK being one, Canada, Australia, and where a number of our diplomats also go into their institutions to serve. Australia has played a pivotal role time and again, both historically, when you look at our, how our history uh, has been intertwined with Australia, our forces with their forces, and right up to the present time. So I wanted to underscore it. Um, I think that, going back to the core point, alliances matter greatly to our national security. They're definitely a benefit to us. Thank you. That was an excellent uh, summation of, of the value of the alliances and various dimensions of it. I did particularly appreciate you mentioning common values, mm -hmm. because I think sometimes when we look at political military alliances, we forget that. So thank you very much. Greg, thanks very much. And let me also say thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's actually a real privilege for me to be here with such a distinguished panel and the panels before and the panel coming up. And a special thanks to my friend Will, who has invited me here three times, and I finally made it on the third time. Um, I would start by saying it's great to be out of outside of the Beltway, but I actually left Washington in May. I'm now at Florida International University in Miami. And it is, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, but I've had a little more time to reflect on what's been happening and on this subject. So let me try to offer a few random, but hopefully not incoherent thoughts to try to pull some of these threads together and, and to reinforce some of the points that Elliot and Paula have already mentioned. In, in looking at alliances and partnerships, let me suggest that uh, we look at partnerships not simply on a state-to-state -state basis but we also want to work with civil society as a partner on many issues. Uh, on human rights, for example, uh, civil society organizations in Europe and Eurasia attend an annual meeting in Warsaw called the Human Dimension Meeting of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And they look to the United States to help them reinforce their presence there and give them a platform to speak out against uh, concerns they have uh, in some of their host countries. An initiative that was started in the Bush administration, the broader Middle East and North Africa initiative, was very important and central to that was giving civil society almost for the first time an opportunity to directly challenge some of the officials from their governments. And, and I attended some of those meetings. You all have attended some of those meetings. And I think it's critically important that the United States was really the driving force behind giving civil society an opportunity, showing that we are partners with them and helping them speak out its, in some cases, its significant risk. The private sector and, and civil society organizations that are implementing organizations play a key role. There was mentioned earlier this morning about PEPFAR, President Bush's initiative to deal with AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis in Africa, and it's been broadened beyond Africa, where the private sector and uh, NGOs play a key role in this. They're real partners in implementing an initiative that has saved literally millions of lives. So when, when we talk about alliances and partnerships, I think it's important to understand it isn't just state to state, but there are other players here too. That said, let me focus a little more on the states. And as Paula mentioned, and Elliot too, and others in, in the earlier panels, democratic countries tend to be our best allies. The countries with whom we share values will be the most reliable allies. They'll be our best trading partners. They'll be our partners when big decisions have to be made on war and peace issues, on, on sending troops into action. Um, there are exceptions to every rule. We saw this in 2003 with two key European allies who opposed uh, our, our move into Iraq. Um, but we also saw tremendous diplomacy uh, put to use in 1991 uh, in pushing Iraq out of Kuwait, where diplomacy played a key role in bringing together such an important group of countries. We saw it in Libya. Um, with the intervention in Libya to prevent a bloodbath in Benghazi, where the UK and France played a critical role in that. And I think we did the right thing, by the way, in Libya, 
and intervening, but then did the wrong thing and then leaving and dropping the ball. And Libya, unfortunately, now is quite a mess. Um, but we also have challenges with countries that are formal, formally allies. You look at Turkey, uh, a, a NATO uh, m uh, ally of ours, but the situation inside Turkey is becoming more and more challenging for us when it comes to the issue of values, uh, attacks on journalists, treatment of opposition, and, and other things. Even concerns in countries that we thought were on a steady path toward consolidated de democracies with situation in Hungary, for example, even, uh, it pains me to say, in Poland these days. So some of our formal allies, countries with whom we have shared our values in the past, don't always stay on the same path. And we ourselves, by the way, have to stay true to our own values and principles and make sure we stay on the right path as well. We need our allies and our partners around the world for UN Security Council resolutions. If we want to get things done in the UN for all of its faults and shortcomings and the veto power that is granted to China and Russia, we still need allies to get things done in the Security Council. If we want to get things done in the very controversial UN Human Rights Council, we need allies there. Or in the third committee of the UN, Elliot and I were talking about this earlier. We also need civil society as a driving force to get some of these resolutions, special rapporteurs appointed in, in dealing with some of these, questions, some of these uh, challenging countries. We, we need allies, uh, Paula mentioned about sanctions, in pressuring bad regimes and imposing sanctions. In the Bush administration, we did this in the case of Belarus, where we went to Europe on numerous occasions, uh, State Department and Treasury, to work with our allies in imposing very tough uh, sanctions on the Lukashenko regime. And it was critically important that it was the United States and Europe together. The United States can impose sanctions on others, and I know we have a panel coming up after that will talk about this extensively. Um, the extraterritorial nature of U.S. sanctions is quite powerful and not to be underestimated. But sanctions will have a much greater impact if we're doing it together with allies to cut off avenues for the sanction targets so that they don't have means of escaping the sanctions. But in, in pursuing unity on sanctions, Paula talked about the sanctions on Russia, we have to be careful not to confuse means and ends. Everyone wants the United States and Europe to be on the same page in sanctioning Russia. I don't know anyone who would argue for disunity. But the goal should not be unity between the US and Europe on sanctions on Russia. That is a means to accomplish the end, which should be to get Russia out of Ukraine. That's our goal. That's our objective. And it is difficult for 28 member states in the European Union to all agree on sanctions. I'm actually impressed that they've gone as far as they have. It should be easier, though it's not easy, easier for one government, and the reason it's not easy is our government is enormous, but it should be easier for our government on our own, if we have to, to go ahead with tougher sanctions, even if it means doing so without the European Union. It would be great if we stayed together, but sometimes we just have to take the lead, and, and that leads me to the point about US leadership. US leadership, there is no substitute for. We have to show the way. We have to stay true to our values and principles, and we have to hold countries to account that stray from the commitments they've made, whether under the UN Declaration of Human Rights or as a member of the Council of Europe or the OSCE or any other organization in which there are human rights commitments that have been made. We also have to stand with countries that aren't formally in alliances with us, countries such as Ukraine or Georgia that aspire to join. And by the way, as long as countries aspire to join either the uh, EU or NATO, we must be doing something right. That when the day comes that countries no longer want to join our organizations, then we really need to step back and wonder what we're doing and what our future is. But as long as a country like Ukraine, 44 million people, and Georgia, three and a half million people, continue to contribute forces to NATO efforts, and continue to reach the, and satisfy the criteria, we should, it, at a minimum, keep the door open to them. And the only way that they have a prospect of one day joining is if the United States leads the way. US leadership, however, is not a guarantee that we will prevail. If you look at the 2008 NATO summit in Bucharest, President Bush firmly got behind the push for a membership action plan for Ukraine and Georgia at that summit and failed. Chancellor Merkel was not in favor of granting, in particular, a map for Georgia. 
I would argue the failure by NATO to agree on giving a membership action plan to Georgia is one of the causes of Russia's invasion a few months later uh, in, in August 2008. And yet there was rather forward-leaning language that came out of that NATO communique in which NATO agreed that Ukraine and Georgia will one day become members of NATO. The United States needs to make sure we, we follow through on that commitment. And I commend Vice President Pence on his visit to Georgia in late July, early August this year, in which he reaffirmed the administration's support for Georgia's uh, prospective membership in NATO. We need to listen carefully to our allies and partners who have rather direct, and in many cases, unfortunate experience in dealing with Russia, or allies and partners who have similar experiences with China or Iran. Proximity in, the, in these cases can give us very valuable information in forming our diplomatic, our military, our intelligence strategies and policies. Maintaining alliances and partnerships requires a lot of work. Our, our previous panels talked about this. A lot of interaction, a lot of face-to-face uh, -face meetings. Uh, uh, emails and, and Skypes don't substitute for getting to know people and trying to build and develop and nurture these kinds of partnerships. Paula was talking about NATO, greatest military alliance in history. The pressure on allies to contribute burden sharing is absolutely right, and it's been going on for a long time. But we also have to make sure we don't do it in a way that undermines the reliability of the United States as a country that will be there in a time of need. So finding the right balance and pressing our allies and partners on burden sharing uh, is always a tricky dance. Last point, um, diplomacy requires diplomats. <laughs> it may sound obvious. But to have diplomats, you have to name them to positions. And I am stunned at the few nominations or intents to nominate, let alone confirmations that we have seen so far in this administration. It is October. The world, there's, there's no pause button that we hit and ask the world, just give us some time while we reorganize the State Department, while we figure out whom we want to pick for uh, which spot, which spots we might eliminate. We've got to do both, and we've got to fill positions. We know there will always be an assistant secretary for East Asian Affairs or the Middle East. There is now, as of today, an assistant secretary for Europe and Eurasia, a terrific guy, Wes Mitchell. But we have to do a much better job of filling these key positions. This is no intent, intended slight of the Foreign Service and Civil Service. Fantastic people in both, in both services. But you need people empowered through Senate confirmation and presidential appointment who can carry out US foreign policy and diplomacy. And it pains me to see how many positions are unfilled. There are way too many special envoy positions. There were in the Bush administration in which we serve. There certainly were in, in the Obama administration. They, they grew even more in the State Department. Eliminate a lot of them, but you know certain positions are going to be there. And so I, I would hope that Secretary Tillerson and the White House can work out whatever differences they may have and prioritize this as one of the uh, top things to get done. Thank you. Thank you, David. I have about 50 questions, and I'm having trouble, especially after uh, David's really robust, tough-minded, but not hard-nosed uh, uh, sort of exposition on, on uh, what's important in our alliances, uh, you know, I want to ask a question about sort of U.S. leadership and whether these alliances, how far they can go without us, mm -hmm. uh, in the case potentially of Iran or the Paris Agreement or, or whatever. I'd love to ask a question about uh, sort of the full range of uh, arrows in our diplomatic quiver mm -hmm. and how we put those to use. What I'm going to ask is a, is a more foundational question, and it really follows what what you just uh, said, David, the, uh, the State Department was, of course, the first federal department. Uh, it was established to lead in foreign relations, uh, and it has done that over the years. Uh, there's a lot of talk of diminishing the U.S. leadership, and my question to all of you is, how well is the State Department positioned now to lead in in U.S. Uh, diplomatic relations or foreign relations, number one. And number two, if you could move all the pieces 
what would you do to, to uh, improve its capacity in that regard? So I open it up. I'll start. Um, <clears throat> well, on the latter question, how would you move the pieces around? Um, if you came to me, if I were in the State Department today and you came to me and asked me that question, I would say, get out of my office. Um, uh, we, <laughs> um, we have so many problems, you know, China, Iran, I mean, Russia, um, and we've spent too much time moving pieces around. We, ne we need to concentrate on those policy issues. The State Department, yeah, needs to be better organized, needs to be a better bureaucracy, get rid of the special envoys um, someday over time. But you know, uh, I mean, I went through Condoleezza Rice's um, reorganization of foreign aid. Endless amounts of bureaucratic effort. Real world impact? Yep. Zero that I can see. So I would say, let's stop focusing on that stuff. Yep. The State Department under 10 different Secretaries of State functioned uh, well or poorly, depending largely on the President and the Secretary. Let's use the mechanism we have um, and get to work. Yep. The focus. I, I, I see it a, a little bit differently. Uh, first, you want to give him his job back, right? <laughs> first, uh, 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 Elliot did mention, and I think it's actually, it needs to be developed, is this issue of these envoys. When I worked at the State Department at the time when first Colin Powell was Secretary of State and then Condoleezza Rice later, but I remember at the very beginning, he then had, was confronted with close to, I think about 120 envoy ships. <laughs> Now, this administration, I think it's even well over that number in terms of the number of envoy ships that were sitting at the department. Why does it matter? It sends confused signals abroad to people if you're an assistant secretary for East Asian Affairs and there's an envoy, let's say, to North Korea. I'll just pick that out. Um, maybe it might be vital and maybe some are by statutory, um, uh, you know, actually by, by set up by statutory um, uh, legislation. Um, but in this case, I would say that when you look at the majority, the majority can be redundant, repetitive, and really send uh, out mixed signals. I'd also say that it's worth looking at, so, so that whole list, I remember from the 120, whatever it was, I think we ended up with maybe 10 that remained actually in then the George W. Bush administration. Literally, uh, uh, Secretary Powell posed the challenge, you defend it. If you don't defend it, it's gone. And actually, most people didn't uh, because they knew that a lot of this was redundant and repetitive. But there's a second, and that is re-examining, are we equipped in terms of modern day diplomacy. And what do I mean by modern day diplomacy? I'll pick out an area that gets overlooked a lot uh, uh, is public diplomacy. Not that many people are interested in it or strategic communications. But you know what's problematic? You can have a great policy, but if you don't have good strategic communications up front, your policy could really fail because it may not be understood by, the by your friends, by your allies. So the actual organization, I, would, I, I wouldn't shove people yet out of the office. <laughs> I'd have at least a further discussions on some areas in terms of technologies, in terms of, as I mentioned, strategic communications, ways in which I think the department needs to come into this century. This will tell you something. During my time at the department, uh, when Secretary Powell was the Secretary of State, we retired the Wang. So I remember that when he made the big announcement of that. I mean, you know, it needed to I don't be. Think most of these people know what a wing is. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, I even uh, was wondering myself, quite frankly, when, and was shocked when he announced that. But the point just is, I do think that some reform here um, is, is, is warranted and stepping back the uh, meaning in terms of the department. And I've been very struck by a number of institutions that, like the Academy of American Academy of Diplomacy, the Atlantic Council, they've brought former diplomats together, uh, some with some political uh, appointees, some not, and basically debating what are the kinds of changes that could really strengthen our diplomatic uh, prowess and our diplomatic stance. Um, I don't have much more to add. I mean, I. Uh, I, 
I think there, there are too many special envoys. Um, but as I said before, you know there are going to be certain positions that need to be filled. Um, the regional assistant secretaries aren't going to be eliminated. They need to be filled. Um, the bureau that we all, in one form or another, have a connection to, the Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor Bureau, was created by Congress. You can't eliminate that bureau unless Congress does, and they're not going to. Um, it would send a really positive signal for the administration to fill that position. Elliot and I were talking about one person. I won't name his name, because if I endorse the person, he will have no chance of being nominated. Um, but um, uh, an appointment in that bureau would send a positive signal. Particularly where, so far on democracy, human rights issues, I would say the administration has not been that great, except, say, on Venezuela, on Cuba, a uh, few exceptions to this. But otherwise, the signal that has been sent is, your, your affairs, we're not going to interfere or meddle. Um, and, and so it seems to me that, that whatever the logjam is, it needs to be broken so that we can stop talking about this. In fact, we shouldn't be talking about this. And, October, um, and instead we can actually have a more focused discussion on the policy challenges. Frankly, the administration and we, to a degree, are wasting our time by bitching and moaning about the lack of people in these positions. We shouldn't even be having this discussion. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take, uh, we're going to, the panelists are going to take uh, questions uh, from all of you. And uh, one of the panelists does actually have to leave sharply at three, so our objective is to, uh, to finish up this session at that time. Okay, sir, so the uh, blue jacket and the white shirt. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, just here. Yes. Okay, can we hold it? Uh, my name is Sammy Yub, I'm a faculty at UT. And my question is for Elliot. Um, so, so with regard to the uh, uh, the, the Egypt situation. Um, I very much appreciate your insight about the Nile situation. I'm, I'm Egyptian American and I'm very much aware that in the Nile Delta of Egypt it's very hard to get water to just basic for irrigation. So it is really dire. So my question I guess is, what is the limits of these alliances? Especially after the coup situation in Egypt a few years ago. And what's the future of the, uh, of the uh, democracy uh, promotion agenda in the region? Thank you. Wow. Um, we'd be finished by about seven. <laughs> um, what are the limits of these alliances? That's a really interesting question. And I mean, today we would ask that question most about Turkey. I mean, in what sense is Turkey a good ally today? Um, at what is the point at which we're going to say, you know, they're not really acting like an ally at all? I guess I'd say there's no real answer to that question as we, as we look at the external and internal uh, activities. Uh, and there are certain things that, that really can bust up an alliance. One of them is, for example, the treatment of individuals, the treatment of foreign service nationals or American diplomats, for example. And we've had some of that recently with, with Turkey, and we've had it with Egypt, where American NGO workers, this goes back to the Obama years, were arrested, indicted, um, can't go back to Egypt, or for the ones who are Egyptians, in some cases, can't leave. We, you know, I, wish, I frankly wish we would say that's not something we're willing to put up with in an alliance, and I wish we would react more strongly because we are, after all, a superpower here. Um, I wish we would do more about the number of Americans imprisoned in various places around the world. Um, I, it, you should think twice and twice again before arresting and jailing an American anywhere in the world. And I don't think we're tough enough on that. And I don't think we make people pay for arrest. And I'm not talking about an American who commits a common crime. Obviously, that's different. I'm talking about political activities, official or unofficial. Um, so I don't know what the limits are, but I actually would like to make them, um, I'd like to move them actually a little bit closer so that many forms of behavior that I think should threaten an alliance are considered to be uh, simply unacceptable. i just make one comment on your latter point, and that is the human rights in Egypt. You know, I think we need to think about this pragmatically. Um, what kind of an Egypt is being created 
if, um, and I, this is a pretty widely accepted number, 60,000 young people are political prisoners. That means they've never been convicted of a crime. Most have not been tried even. They have not committed acts of violence, and they're in prison, where, by the way, they're going to meet lots of jihadis who will be happy to explain to them why jihad is the right path and say to them, you know, the injustice you're suffering shows you why it's the right path. What is that? That's a jihadi manufacturing plant when you put that many people in prison. So it isn't just that we should be concerned about human rights in Egypt because we are Americans, we believe in human rights, yes, but also because it's pushing Egypt or pulling Egypt down a road that I think leads to uh, real instability in the future. Can I, can I just add very quickly um, two points? One is it, when the Obama administration sanctioned Russia last December, it cited harassment mm -hmm. of American diplomats that were stationed in Russia um, when it expelled 35 Russian uh, officers and closed down the two Russian facilities. Um, I don't know what weight that was given. Uh, interference in the election was obviously the the dominant issue in that decision. Um, Elliot mentioned the case of, of the NGO trial. Uh, and they, all, all the people involved were convicted, not just indicted. Uh, I was the president of Freedom House at the time in 2011, December 2011, when Egyptian authorities raided our office and the office of uh, four other organizations. Um, the US government at the time focused on the Americans who were involved, understandably and once they were allowed to leave Egypt, washed its hands of the whole thing. Um, I had Egyptian staff whom we had to take out of the country, um, and they have not been able to return to their country since. They were convicted in, in a completely ridiculous trial in June 2013. It's October 2017. They still can't go home. Um, so I would hope that this administration would do a better job than the previous administration are looking out not just for American citizens who work for NGOs like Freedom House or IRI, NDI, ICFJ, but also for local citizens who make, in some cases, a risky decision. They know the risks, but they do it because they believe in the cause, and we stand with them as well. The questions. Sir, right here. Uh, you right there in the dark blazer. <laughs> Leaving aside how you feel about it, although if you want to share that, I'd love to hear it. What are the, the Iran deal? What are the potential negative consequences, if any, if we choose to walk away from the deal diplomatically? So long-term credibility of the United States, are there negative consequences? Um, how severe are they one way or the other? I just, I, I think that's a subject that it, no matter how much you read, I, I think that's very, misunderstood at least by me, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on one or both. Let's see. I'll start. Um, the Europeans are going to be very unhappy, uh, and I don't much care, um, because they're trying to make money in Iran, and the way they're making money in Iran supports a vicious, despicable, brutal tyranny that is destabilizing the whole Middle East and that is a great threat to several of our allies in the Gulf, in Jordan, in Israel. Uh, and that commerce uh, should not be as important as uh, safety and freedom. Um, I have read frequently that you know we're going to be totally isolated. I don't think we're going to be totally isolated. First of all, we have other allies. We have allies in the region whose necks are on the line. They're going to think this is great. But the Europeans, you know, um, we've heard this before. We have heard before how anything we do in Iran is going to isolate us because the Europeans will never follow. Well, basically, if we do our sanctions, what we are saying to you know, HSBC or to uh, Bank Paribas or to Siemens is, you can do business in Iran. You just can't do business in Iran and America. So that's a $400 billion economy. And this is a slightly larger economy. Choose. And we're allowed to do that. We're a sovereign country. Um, and they can make that choice. I mean, we can't make it illegal to do business in Iran, in Germany. But we can certainly say it's a privilege to do business in the United States. And the history of Iran sanctions suggests that they're, gonna, that they're going to choose the American market. And in fact, the amount, there were a lot of announcements about European investment in Iran. 
but people have, invest, have not invested a lot of money. I think we say we're waiting to see. What's the next administration and what is its policy going to be? And we'll know more about that on what uh, today, tomorrow, whenever this announcement comes. But um, I'm generally in sympathy with the president's view. I think it was a terrible deal. Uh, I think it was poorly negotiated. Um, and while it was being negotiated, I had a lot of British and French diplomatic friends tell me <clears throat> that they thought it was being poorly negotiated because we were, in essence, desperate for a deal, which is no way to start a negotiation. Um, and we know what's wrong with it. I mean, it's, this is not brain surgery. It only lasts 10 years. It should last longer. It doesn't cover intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are essentially, essentially uh, developed in order to carry a nuclear warhead. So why are they doing that? It allows them to modernize um, their enrichment of uranium by dealing with more and more uh, modern centrifuges uh, during this period of 10 years. Um, we have no way of knowing what's going on in Iran's military sites. They are off limits to the IAEA. But those are the sites where uh, traditionally they have done a lot of nuclear research. As Senator Tom Cotton said last week, if Iran does not have a clandestine nuclear weapons program today, it would be the first time in 30 years that they don't have one. So uh, I, um, I would like to see the president do what American law permits him to do, not jump out of the deal. Say, I can't certify that it's a good deal. We have a, something of a common view with the Europeans on how to strengthen it. Let's talk about it for three months, for nine months, for 12 months, and then we'll get to the issue of whether uh, to snap back all the sanctions. But let's try diplomacy first. That would be my view. There at the back, you with the red hair. <laughs> Hi, my name is Josephine McReynolds, and I'm a fourth year here at UT. My question is mostly for Dr. Dobriansky. Is that, are you a doctor? Is that what you prefer? Yes, I do. Right. I do have a PhD. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador, Undersecretary, I just, which one do you want? That's that's not my question. Sorry, what did you Whichever say? I was like, which one do you want? Yeah. Paula. Uh, just call me just Paula. Paula. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it's no question that an alliance is extremely essential to any reasonable government. However, I don't think I need to summarize what happened in the past 18 months in NATO member countries to make people think that governments are much less reasonable. So my question is, I guess, how logical would it be to be concerned about either a far shift of NATO leaders to a you know, far right practice, a fascist practice, being more offensive to other nations, or a decrease in its effectiveness, or God forbid, its disintegration altogether. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. In fact, in my comments, I was, uh, excuse me, I was originally going to reference the political trends in Europe as also one of the challenges confronting our institutions, NATO, the architecture of of Europe and also the transatlantic relationship. I'd say, and so I think you're, you're quite right in pointing it out, uh, in the sense that uh, there's been concern. Uh, many Europeans uh, speak to the Russian interference in their elections very directly. Um, you hear this time and again. You look at also the investment, and let me just state what's going on, the investment, by the way, of Russia into a great deal of information through RT, Russia to Today. It, I don't know how many of you have ever uh, uh, turned on RT abroad, but if you do, you wouldn't necessarily know that it's Russia uh, uh, television. Uh, you have Americans talking about Americans in English. Um, uh, uh, and to me, it's, it's, it's really uh, amazing to actually see it, to watch it. Um, uh, in terms of not just only radio broadcasts, uh, relationships that are forged, um, uh, different parliamentarians who have been courted, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, you are very wise to, to flag it. But that goes to my point. And my point was, I said that I think uh, uh, 
two of the areas that are most crucial for us is the moral narrative, not just only our alliance and the military component and the show of force and the solidification of our forward deployment of, of troops as a deterrent and a showing that there's this unity of purpose, but at the same time, we have to be committed to a moral narrative. We have to be committed to what we are about. If we don't speak up about it and there is a complacency, then who's going to speak up about it? And that's why I reference Putin going back to 2007 when he started to talk about, well, we don't identify with these values. We don't identify with these institutions. We have to fight against that. And that's not just the United States. Uh, if we don't value the kind of architecture that we've had post um, uh, World War II and post Cold War, the rules-based order, or <coughs> liberal international order, then who is going to stand up and defend it? So part of, in my view, a, you know, a kind of deterrent value and also a protective value, it's not just only about military. You need the military as the strong backdrop for your diplomacy, but we need to be vigorous and standing up for the very ideas that we have fought for and that we stand for. So yes, we should be concerned, and yes, we need to act. And that's why I think you heard all three of us, when David concluded, I said, you know, all three of us, there's one thing I'd pick out that we all said, we all underscored the importance of US leadership and US engagement. Can I just add very quickly one thing? Um, one of the challenges I think NATO is starting to face is you have some NATO member states doing more dealing with Russia. Uh, you look at the Erdogan-Putin relationship and Turkey's decision to buy advanced systems from Russia. That is going to create serious complications for NATO in terms of interoperability and, and also infiltration by Russia into uh, NATO member states and their weapon systems and other things. Um, the NATO-Russia Council, uh, the creation of it, I don't think has much to point to in terms of uh, positive results. Um, I'm not arguing for ending uh, talks with Russia. Uh, we have to, but our expectations should be incredibly low. But we do have to keep an eye on Turkey and Hungary, Italy, um, and dealings with Russia to make sure that Russia is not trying to sow divisions in the alliance because through, through their propaganda and now through their military relationships, that's exactly what they're trying to do. Okay, I'm going to forego the question that I reserved and uh, uh, allow one more question here, and then we uh, probably will have to end at that point. So we've got someone pointing, everybody, I know someone over there is popular. Uh, Ma'am, uh, you there on the aisle? Thank you. Uh, my name is Melanie Scruggs, and I'm a master's student at the LBJ School. And my question is about the Paris Agreement. Um, as you know, the president has pulled us out of the agreement, saying that uh, we need a deal that's better for the United States. So my question is, from your perspective, what does that look like? Um, how much progress are we going? Are we making towards that? And uh, from your point of view, is climate change inherently a different type of diplomatic challenge um, from more traditional security threats? I'll respond to that question, because uh, during the Bush administration, when I was Under Secretary of State for eight years, I happened to be the climate change negotiator and dealing with the question of Kyoto. If you may recall, the United States indicated that it was not going to go ahead and support Kyoto. And you may also recall that, well, there was quite an evolution during that period of time, and then ultimately a decision that had been taken by many countries that they were not going to go forward with Kyoto, although they originally embraced it. And basically the fundamental reason why was because the terms that had been set were set in such a way that the targets could never be met. So actually what was put forward, interestingly enough, during the Bush administration was what we called the major uh, well, we called them major emitters, <laughs> but then they wanted to be called the major emerging economies that basically were growing their economies and were also emitting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, 
China overtook the United States in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, there were others. The point was, it began to become apparent to many that a bottom-up approach is the most effective approach. Why? What you do and what action you take in China is different from the United States, where we are, is as different from Sweden, is as different from the UK. In each place, there are a variety of environmental and energy and economic considerations that you have to look at. So my answer to your question just broadly is, I think that this is still, uh, uh, there's going to be a debate and a discussion on this about what are the most effective strategies. I think that there were certain principles and a framework that, interestingly enough, that some components of it that actually were derived from, interestingly enough, the Bush administration, which then the Obama administration embraced. But where the differences are, are, I think, over regulation at home and how one deals with it. It's not so much the international piece, but it's more what you do in terms of regulatory action, where a regulatory action can make a difference and where it doesn't make a difference. And there are just disputes about it. And I think that two things will happen. There'll be a vigorous debate here in the United States over these issues as driven by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and then secondly, I think internationally, as I said, I think that many of the countries uh, definitely would like to have the United States engaged. And my view is that through the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, there'll continue to be a discussion, even in light of the position that has been taken by the United States. Well, I want to thank uh, the panelists for a fascinating discussion. Uh, I would say this, if we can continue to get uh, people of your thoughtfulness and intellect and integrity uh, into the State Department, uh, then clearly it will be, it will be leading. And I will have uh, less, less concern than I do now <laughs> about that. So uh, thank you for coming. I think we can... <laughs>